If you want to go ahead and make it to chapter 12, and Hebrews chapter 12 is kind of where we will we'll camp out this morning, verses 18 through 28. This month has a lot in store for us. We are thankful and we remember the service of those who continue to serve in our communities and our families, those that gave it all, we remember. But we are very much thankful and reminded during the month of November, specifically as it comes next to the month of December, in the sense of we have a risen Savior that's alive and living today, that paid a cost that could not be repaid. And there's a reminder of this as we, as we go into thanksgiving. We're reminded of this grace-filled offering that was given to us. This grace-filled offering that was given so that we might have the religious freedom that we have. The religious freedom in Christ. We're reminded in, in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews that is, we're reminded of the fact that He is one that cannot be shaken. Amen? Our God is not shaken by the circumstances of this world. Our God is not shaken by the circumstances of, of this age and time. It does not throw Him off, throw Him back, set Him off of His stance. Our God is always where He has been. And He will remain there. And so in that, in that understanding that He cannot be shaken... And even though the world around us seemingly is shape-shifting overnight into something we do not realize or recognize, I want us to remember, remember what, what has been said in these books of, book of Hebrews, but also what the warning is behind it. Not to refuse that gracious word through Jesus. Because herein lies the greatest amount of thanksgiving and freedom that we have. You and I, as human beings created by God, have been afforded an opportunity to name ourselves in the sense of salvation through Jesus Christ, a child of God, or to reject Him. We have been given the greatest freedom in the sense of religion and religious and Christ than anybody could ever partake in and, and be involved in. There's a, there's a measure of assurance that comes when you know who Christ is, isn't it? You have a measure of assurance because there's not a lot of things that we can stand on in this life, right, that are assured. There's not a lot of things that we can do that we can really just sink our teeth into and say, that for certain will remain and will hold the test of time. There are a lot of things from friendships to relationships that just crumble and fall apart. But what we have and you and I who know Christ, we have an assurance that cannot be shaken, that cannot be moved. Now there was a gentleman, Albertus Peters, in his book, Divine Lord and Savior. He tells of a believer who was not well educated, but had a deep assurance of his salvation. Everyone called him Old Pete. One day, he, while talking with Dr. Peters, he said, If God should take me to the very mouth of hell and say to me, In you go, Pete. Here's where you belong. I would say to him, That's true, Lord. I do belong there. But if you make me go to hell, your dear son Jesus must go with me. He and I are now one, and we cannot be separated anymore. There's a great freedom knowing that we were bought with a price and that Jesus paid that price for us. That we no longer have a condemnation of, of hell and, and that for our end of our story. There's, there's a greater purpose to why we are living life, and there's a greater purpose behind why we live. And the reminder that, that, that Pete gave here, the reminder that was given to us, is that when we are bought with that price, we are now His and He is ours. There's a, great, there's a great comfort and assurance to know that when we face the things which we all face in this life, they might be different from person to person, but there's a God who does not change. There's a God who remains 
unjolted by the things that we encounter in life, unjolted and unchanged by the things that we face and the things that we do and the ways that we find ourselves so entrenched in this world. There's a God who's not surprised by all of those things. And so this morning, my hope is this, that you are in remembrance of what He did in your life. That you are in the sense of not shaken by the things of this world, but in the, very, in the very best of days, you are reminded of who He is. See, you and I are given a task of living in a world that is not ours. We're given a task of, of being a Christ follower in the midst of the, the, the most hurried and trying times that we, we consider have ever happened. However, we don't walk this walk by ourselves. Amen? You and I don't walk by ourselves. You might say, well, pastor, who's following me? You know, somebody knows where I'm going all the time. Somebody's always with me. And the thing about this, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ, but there's a promise behind the Holy Spirit that walks with us. And that scripture says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. It's a reminder that you too were bought with a price, that Jesus died for you, that even when you didn't know Him as Lord and Savior, He still said you were worth dying for, and as He died for you, He gave you the opportunity to know what freedom's about, to accept or reject the name of Jesus Christ. That's every human being's opportunity. How can you say that's every human being's opportunity? Because no matter where we are, there's an awareness of who God is. And there's an understanding of who God is. And there's a lot of people who know about God that don't have a clue who He is as Lord and Savior. There's a lot of people that, that show up and show out and, and, and come to and be a part of every church, of every facet, of every kind, of every denomination, of every part for their whole life. And church attendance is not going to get you to heaven. It's only Jesus Christ. And saying you believe in Christ without having Him in your heart will come evident in your life when you face what is your hardest day. When you look at the world around you and say, why is this world like it is? All we have to do is look to our right and see that He is standing with us. The strength that He has is our strength. The might that He has is our might. And we don't go out wandering in this world as if we have no purpose. We walk with a God who sent Jesus and the Holy Spirit that comes with us. So if we go, wherever we go, it's the grace of God that's with us. If I were to ask you this morning, what are you thankful for? My hope is that the first and foremost thing that many of us would say was, I am thankful for my salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen? I am thankful that He saw me as ugly and desperate and sin-filled as I was, and chose to love me when He could have chose the opposite. When my deserving of what I've deserved and what I'm entitled to is to walk right into the gates of hell and make my home there because I've already done that. What I am, what I am due is that, but what I have been given cannot be ever equated by human conditions. What I've been given has been a grace-filled offering through the mercy of Jesus Christ who died for us and now is with us through the Holy Spirit. What I've been given can never be repaid, but I have to remember that I don't walk in my own shoes every morning. I walk in His. And I am bought with a price. And that price is costly. So in the book of Hebrews, we were, we're reminded of exactly what happens around us. The created things and we're also reminded of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Now, now we look at this, this, this passage this morning, and it, and it really brings about this. This is Israel's terrifying experience at the foot of Mount Sinai. It kind of echoes back to the Exodus 19. But in Hebrews 12, it, it, is, a, it is an understanding of destinations and connections that Christians already have through Jesus and His covenant. So there's very much a reminder of what they are there for and what is being reminded. In this passage, there's, there's nothing that says necessarily that, that they are next to a temple, but it is a representation of God's final sacrifice through Jesus Christ. It is a reminder not to turn back to the old life. 
How many of us need that reminder to not turn around to the former things? It's also a reminder not to return to the way things were. It is very much a call to faith. When it is a call to faith, it serves as a reminder for you and me that we are not just to live life. We are to live His life with boldness and with passion. And unfortunately, so many of us have forgotten that passion. We're passionate about athletics. We're passionate about a lot of things in this world. We're passionate about our families and our kids. Where's our passion for the Lord that never leaves us? that sustains us, that, that's there with us. And this reminder this morning, this is what Israel's seeing. And, and for Israel, it's something terrifying as, as they think of it, but it is very much a reminder for you and I. It says in verse 18, as we read from 18 to 28, if you've got your copy of God's Word, it is, it is right there before you. Verse 18, it says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a, speaking, a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Why was he trembling? He was in the presence of God. We have to remember the reverence and the awe of being in the presence of God, don't we? We have lost that in a generation or two. That when we come before God, our knees should buckle a little bit. There's a reverence that comes knowing that we stand before the King of kings and Lord of lords. There's a reverence and a power and a reminder that the people are getting, the Israelites are getting here, that there's a reminder of what He is and who He is. And so it brings forth the, the city, the Mount Zion. As it says in verse 22, it says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Hold on there. Did, did they just say he was a living God? Did not Jesus die? But he is living. He always has been. From the very beginning of the earth, from the creation of everything, God has been and always will be. That means that is something to which will not be shaken or moved. That he has been and will stand the test of time. That although everything fades as temporary around us, he never fades. Amen? And so we say, the living God, because we believe He is still alive and well in and through us for His good working. It says of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly in the church, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them here on earth, how much less are we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now has promised, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens." The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken might remain. Verse 28, Therefore, since we are a receiving, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Come on, read that again with me. Y'all don't get excited about this. Y'all are still asleep. That cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably, and with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Read that. Read that. That's God's word right there. There's a reminder of the reverence and the awe that we should have. There's a reminder of the fact that He is not going to be taken aback by our small issues. 
that he is now going to be taken aback and is not taken aback by the things that are going on in our world today. He does not sit to the wayside or sit to the side or did not live once years ago and we're talking about him as if he's in the past. Our God is an all-consuming fire that cannot, cannot be shaken, y'all. Y'all, we face so many things in this world and it knocks the wind out of us. It takes us off the charted path. It takes us off of where God wants us to go. It takes us off all of these things. See, God cannot be moved. And if I find myself standing in the midst of that hurricane of this life, God is standing with me. Or should I put it like this? We're standing with God. We ought to be holding on to God at all costs. When we face the troublesome days ahead, when we stand at the foot of the mountain, when we were, we're reminded of how our, how our hearts and minds and lives have been delivered by God, and when we're reminded of the power of God, that we stand before a holy God who loves us, cannot be shaken, we live in the kingdom of God as God's holy people, we do not need to worry about this life. We need to worry about living in a way that's acceptable that pleases God, that holds true to the fact that He holds us. We need to hold on to Him. So what can't be shaken? What are the things that cannot, cannot be shaken? That means the people of God, the kingdom of God, the ones who are called to faith. Now, who are the ones called to faith? Is it just you, and, just you and I, or is it all of us? Is it just one or two of us? Is it deacons and pastors that are called to faith? Is it just Sunday school teachers that are called to faith? Is it just vacation and Bible school people that are called to faith? Or are we all called to faith? Each and every human being is called to faith. Firstly, to know Christ. Secondly, to live like it. Let me, let me say that one more time. We're called to know Christ, and then we're called to live like it. Live like Christ is at the center of our lives. Live like Christ is holding us and we're holding on to Him on the hardest, hardest, difficult days ahead. All of those things. We need to remember that He will not be shaken. When you and I hear the diagnosis of cancer, He does not buckle and run away. When we hear the worst days ever are ahead, when we've lost a loved one or when someone has died defending that flag right there, we remember that God is still there. We remember on these days such as this that there are some that gave all and there are all that gave some for this flag to stand here. And there are some in our lives we need to remember in the sense of they stood in a gap that we could not stand. And there are many men and many women that still stand in that gap today. But there are none in comparison to the God who does not move, is not shaken, that is an all-consuming fire. And so that drives you and, my, you and me to do what? To come before God in trembling, in fear, in awe of the might of God who looks at us and says, I love them, but not only do I love them, but I walk with them. Why do they not walk with me anymore? We live in a country that we seemingly have all the freedoms of things we want in the sense of all things are seemingly acceptable now, aren't they? But not all things are profitable. God lays before us a road map that says there are things which will pass away and there are things that will go away because of the might of God. But I will not be moved. And the scripture says this here, and, and it's reminded in verse 28, it says that we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is an all-consuming fire. With reverence and awe. Y'all, you know, I just argue the fact this morning, we've, we've forgotten what reverence and awe is all about. That when we come into the house of the Lord, it's just a place to inhabit. This is not a place to inhabit. This is a place to get refilled, recharged, spend time worshiping the Lord so that we can face what's out there. 
And what out there, what's out there tries to shake us to the core of who we are. And don't think that Satan won't get in on the action, y'all. We like to think, well, I'm just suffering through these things in life. Satan's piggybacking on that and saying, you know what? They might be suffering with this, but I'm going to grind into them hard. And we forget that God is with us. He does not leave us. He stays right there. He stays with us and remains with us so that when we are fighting, which I believe we understand we've got to fight. When we are fighting, we understand that He is fighting for us. We're just fighting along with Him in the power of God in a world that needs to understand there's more to this life than just living and going into the grave. That there's more to this life than just us interpreting what we ought to be doing when God has laid before us all that is. And it's said that I am the great I am. He has laid before us, and, and for us, that should evoke a response in our life. And I think that we forget. No, we get complacent. No, we get just, just so ingrained in our daily go and go and go that we forget that we are to come before God with reverence and awe. That we are to remember the sacrifice that was given to us so that we might be able to live spiritually. We get so comfortable that we forget that God fights with us. And when we get comfortable and we start doing things like that, we start doing things on our own accord, in our own way, and then Satan comes in and hits us like a two-by-four to the head, and we start thinking, well, what am I going to do? The answer has always been God. And the Word of God tells us and teaches us how we ought to react to such a time as this. So how do, we, how do we respond to this? You say, well, Pastor, that's a lot, of, a lot of stuff in there, and I'm kind of afraid right now. How do we respond to this? Be thankful. Be thankful for what God is doing and will do in your life. But also come to Him in a measure of acceptable worship before God with reverence and awe. Y'all, we don't come to church just to decide what we're having for lunch. And we don't just pray around the supper table so we can eat. And we don't just show up and worship God because that's what we do. Y'all, when we get into those kind of mindsets and, and mind frames, that's, that's when it becomes something that's unimportant to us. See, we serve a God who saw us in our iniquity and our pain, and He gave it all for us through Jesus Christ. Even though we don't deserve it, He gave it all for us. And the Holy Spirit of God goes wherever we go, and is with us wherever we fight. And wherever we fight and what tempts us and what guides us, and when we fall and we falter, He is still there. He does not leave us nor abandon us. And we somehow have gone into this life thinking that, well, I'm just afraid of what God might do. I'm more afraid of what this world might do if I don't stand with God. Or what might happen to this world around me if I don't act like Christ is who He is. See, there's a reverence in awe. And our God is an all-consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4.24, it denotes a reverence to God because of His jealous anger against those who desert the true God for idols. There's a lot of things in this world that, that, that vie for our attention that look to get us off task. There's a lot of things in this world. There's a lot of things that come at us just like those hurricanes and just like those things that bring destruction. And what we do in the midst of those things is we look to God. God is the eye in the midst of the storm. He is our calm. But don't get it wrong that God cannot and will not fight for us because He will. God is our strength. He is our God. God. God looked at the people of Israel here, and they came knowing that they had not lived in a manner worthy of the gospel, didn't they? They came knowing that they were at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they were reminded of the fact that they needed to put their lives in the hands of His. There was a future judgment that was coming for those created things. <coughs> And there was a reminder that God's people need not be worried. In the sense of, this is the kingdom of God. 
And so it brings to us and makes us ask questions of ourselves. And see, the greatest things of Scripture and the greatest dialogues of Scripture are not just the words on the page. It's what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? If I were to, if I were to, and I know this is going to bring us down a path where we're hungry now, but if I were to lay before you the greatest cut of meat that you've ever had, and I cooked it to just the level that you love it, and then I garnished it on the side with your favorite sauce, if that's what you like to do, but a good steak doesn't need sauce, does it? Amen? And, and so if I put all of the trimmings and the things around it there, and I said, I'm going to set this steak up just like you like it, I'm going to lay it right here. How many of you would say, you know what? I'm good. But I fixed this just for you. I did this just for you. Why are you not coming and enjoying what I did just for you? See, God has given us a life that we can never repay. Greater than we could ever understand. And with fear and awe, we are to come to Him and to acknowledge Him and to bring acceptable worship to Him. But I tell you, just like I did last week, when is the last Sunday that the men of the church got on their knees and went before God? Somebody said, we live in a time where men don't come to church anymore. Why do we not come down front anymore? Why do we not pray where we are? Why do we not call for this all-consuming fire, the power and the might of God, to speak to a generation that needs to hear what it truly means to follow God? So it brings us to these points as we finish out this morning. If my life is at stake, and it is, isn't it the utmost importance that I trust my life to a credible source? If my life is at stake, isn't it important that I trust my life to a credible source? And see, what, what, it, what it brought to me was the understanding that God will not flinch when we encounter the toughest points of our life. He will not move in those moments. Secondly, if God is my choice, then that has implications for each facet of my life, both here and the future. See, we believe that the the world is monumentally different than it ever has been before. But what we can look at here is the unshakable nature of the kingdom of God, which should give in us a response from that which is unmistakable, and that response should be in reverence and awe and thanksgiving that all our examples of these things, reverence, awe, and thanksgiving, are knee-buckling in themselves. You say, well, knee-buckling. When I go to a wedding, do you mean I'm supposed to hold my knees? No, I'm saying knee-buckling in the sense of when we come to God. There's a thankfulness and a measure to which we have lost that we need to have. See, our God has given us beyond measure more than we could ever repay in our lives. Our God has has fought for us when no one else would. Our God has sent Jesus to die for us when we were so unworthy. So in a day like today where we remember the, 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 the men and women who have fought for us and still fight for us and we still remember that, we are reminded on a day such as today that Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Amen? Amen. So when we look at this life, and we see what we're going to encounter, and we see what we're walking through, God cannot be shaken. And that should be written on our hearts and minds. Although the world around us seems crumbling, God does not move. Although the, the floor goes out from underneath us and we hit that bottom... God does not move. Although we face the difficult diagnosis, God is not moved. Although we deal with the worst life circumstance, God is not moved. See, our God is an all-consuming fire who fights for us and will not and is not taken aback by what we find in life. So let us, let us respond in the right manner. Let us remember what Pete said that, 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 that he said in this, this, this passage or this understanding that, that uh, Dr. Peters was asking him. 
If God should take me to the very mouth of hell and say to me, in you go, Pete, here's where you belong. I would say to him, that's true, Lord, I do belong here. But if you make me go to hell, your dear son, Jesus Christ, will go with me. He and I are now one and cannot be separated. We cannot be separated once we know Christ. We cannot be separated. So why don't we live like that? Why don't we live in that strength, that might, that awe, that reverence, that kind of God? Why doesn't that become our hallmark, our lives, our future? Stand with me. God Almighty, we come before you. God Almighty, we come begging your forgiveness. God, we realize that, that we, have, we have forgotten how mighty and how great you are, God. We have forgotten that we need to come before you in reverence and awe. God, we need to, we need to remember why we were created and God, who created us. God, the freedom that we have in your name is not a freedom that came freely. So God, we trust in you this morning. We trust that your word is true. We trust that you will not be shaken even though the walls fall down around us. God, we trust that you will not be shaken even if we have a day where we're diagnosed with the worst disease ever. God, you are not shaken. God, when we deal with the storms in this life, you are not shaken. God, when we deal with the worst news ever, you are not shaken. God, you remain steadfast in the midst of everything that we consider to be a storm in our lives. So God, we trust in this moment our lives to you, God. God, it's not about just living and dying. It's about what we do in between that. Many will look at their, their loved ones as they are passing from this world to the next, and there's a very invariable dash in between the beginning and the end of their lives. God, I pray what we do in the middle does not matter to us. It matters to you, God. What we do in all that time which you've called and given us to, God, we use it wisely in the sense of we follow you at all costs. God, we remember that there are men and women that fought for us, but we are reminded that you fought hard for us in our souls. You fought for us and gave us Jesus Christ. And we are not deserving of that, but because of that great love, we can know you, oh God. And we can be in that right relationship with you. God, the, the writer of Hebrews reminds us over and again that we need to come before you with fear and trembling. That we need to come with, the, with this reverence and awe before you, God. God, I pray that we don't ever forget that when we come before you, God. God, this morning, if there's someone that has been called to know you as Lord and Savior. God, I pray that today, that day, is their day of freedom. God, I pray on today that they don't wait another day, another moment, another time to know what freedom and you is all about. God, you are an all-consuming fire. And you are, not, you are not knocked on your heels by what they faced in life. In fact, you are like that father that is waiting for that son to come home. God, you stand at a place we are calling us to come home to remember that you have paid that price for us. God, I pray that the souls that are needing salvation come home this morning. God, I pray for the many of us that are gathered here that, that say we're Christians yet don't live like it in this world. God, I pray that we are reminded and brought to our knees by how great and mighty you are. And while the world around us is changing, God, you never, ever change. And you're not scared or taken aback by the things of this world. In fact, it's a call to follow you and hold on to you even more so. Dear God, I pray in this time of invitation, God, that we respond in our hearts and our minds. We respond if we need to by coming down forward. We respond, God, because that's what you called us to do. It's in your most gracious name that we pray. Amen. Well, this evening we will be in, uh, if you'll turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians 2. And this evening we're going to talk about the relationship between Timothy and his companions that were with him. See, Timothy was meant, as Paul used him, and, and those who went with him, Epaphroditus, it was a, a brother, a co-worker, a fellow soldier 
but they were illustrated by Paul as models for Christian life and ministry. So these two were given an example of this is how you ought to act as believers and followers of Christ. These are, these are those that, that are set aside as the example. Now, the book of Philippians really warns the, the members or the people that they are, they're, they're talking to in this, in this time. They are, they're, they're trying to bring forth the understanding that we are to continue the mission. We are not to continue the mission without regard to the lost, but also we are to find fulfillment in God alone. So we are not to forget the lost, and at the very same time, we are to remember that, that God has given us what we need, and in Him and Him alone are we to serve. And so we look at this described, and it, it even talks about these two. If you, if you will uh, put your finger right there, turn over to the book of First Thessalonians, and in chapter 3, and in chapter 3, as starting in verse 2 and going through verse 6, it talks about these two. It talks about Timothy, and it talks about his role in, in making the gospel known, but it talks about his serving well. And so, if you'll turn there real quick, uh, it says here in verse 2, it says, We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way as well as you know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors may have been in vain. Verse 6, but Timothy has, now, has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. So these are, this is Timothy. This is Timothy and those who were with him who, who encouraged other ones in the faith. The, the found faith, or for many, the new found faith that they had was now being encouraged by a follower of Jesus Christ who was directly connected to Paul. As Paul was trying to go throughout, there were many that were sent as well out from Paul that were meant to expand what Paul was trying to do, what God had revealed to them, and these two were part of that. There's, a, there's an illustration that I, that I received as I was looking through this, this sort of being sent, being a coworker, being someone who serves, someone who lives and leads a lasting in, impression on those around us. Thomas Edison, you may never have heard about him, but Thomas Edison, uh, anybody? Thomas Edison? Nobody? Nobody? Okay. All right. He wrote something in tribute to his mother. You can imagine someone named Thomas Edison, and you say, well, well naturally, inventor, writer, he did a lot of great things. Certainly there are people that came along, invested in him, much like Paul to Timothy, much like those that they were seeking to reach. But Thomas Edison spoke about his mother in this way. He said, I did not have my mother long, but she cast over me an influence which has lasted all my life. The good effects of her early training I can never lose. If, I had not been, if it had not been for her appreciation and her faith in me at a critical time in my experience, I should never likely have become an inventor. I was always a careless boy, and with a mother of different mental caliber, I should have turned out badly. But her firmness, her sweetness, her goodness were potent powers to keep me in the right path. My mother was the making of me. The memory of her will always be a blessing to me. And so he, he understood that he didn't get where he was on his own, that he needed the encouragement, sometimes firm encouragement, and discipline of a mother who was looking out for his best interests, realizing that they weren't at the same level of thought, but nevertheless she sought to invest in his life. So as we look at this storyline and we see that Paul chose to use those 
that were in service, Timothy, and others that were in service to, to extend his message, to leave that mark on others that the gospel would extend beyond all they could ever understand, believe, and know. It was very much an understanding of this is, this is how we ought to live. You know, quite often we are great at helping people know Christ, but then following that up, they're just kind of like on their own. One of the greatest regrets growing up was that I felt like when I became a Christian, there was nobody waiting in the wing to direct, like directly disciple me. Now we had discipleship trainers and all that stuff that did it in a roundabout way, but, but at some level, I am jealous of, of those that came along like, like Paul and Timothy who seem to have more of a direct application in how they invested in others. And so you look at this and you see that there's very much a need for you and I to invest in others. First and foremost, we are to model the behavior of Christ in Christian living and how, how others might do that as well. There's a sense of responsibility behind these passages that we are not meant to just make it through this life, but we are meant to help others grow in their knowledge of Christ. We are meant to model that type of behavior. We are meant to encourage others. We are meant to influence others for Christ's sake. We are meant to do something in our Christianity, in our faith life, in our belief that leaves a lasting mark. Now, not to say that growing up there weren't people that invested in me. There were. But to say that there were people that directly invested in me beyond those that, that were required to. You know what I'm saying? There were youth ministers and pastors and leaders. Those people were required to somehow, I felt, to do that. But the ones who left a really, really good impact on me were the ones that, that, that didn't have to care that didn't get paid to care, <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't seemingly have a role or any kind of leadership or any kind of thing, they quietly came along and wanted to encourage, wanted to guide and direct, wanted to offer a, a kind word, wanted to be the Bible unfolded before me in the demeanor which they took to life. And, you know, as a young person, you look to older people that have been down the road a little bit to find what? guidance and wisdom to look for direction and there were several that that in, inevitably left a mark on me although it wasn't direct they left a mark on me and I'm grateful for that in these passages Timothy is modeling Paul's behavior for the people and he wants them to understand what is acceptable what is acceptable can you imagine today if you look around at people and how they live their lives in, in various manners of what is acceptable and not, well, you might say, well, pastor, the acceptability of something is still the same. It does not change. It is not changing. So you see, Paul here is making uh, through Timothy this, this mindset and this understanding. So in verses 20, uh, 19, we'll start in verse 19, and we'll go through these verses here. In verse 19, it talks about this behavior. It says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not only those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how these things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. And then he continues in verse 25, says, But I think it necessary to send back to you, Apo I can't even say his name, Apophilus, there you go, my brother, Epaphroditus, there's my dictionary. <coughs> uh, uh, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and he almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not only him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. 
Therefore, I am more eager to send him so that when you set him again, when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him. Because he almost died for the work of Christ, he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. And so there's very much, there, there's an understanding that Timothy has spent quality time with Paul. There's very much an understandability that, that because of that training at that time, which was very essential and vital and, and well done and crafted in that way, he now feels comfortable sending Timothy out and sending him out in the name of Christ. He very much feels comfortable that God has done something and has created a new work in him and is also going to create a new work in the lives of those that they are encountering. I believe they are, their intention is to spur others on to this same kind of faith journey, to help others understand the validity and the need and the essential need of following Christ and understanding that that in that need and in that understanding that we have to do something for Christ and to follow Christ and to extend the message. See, see, Paul, Paul desperately, I think he was one of those that had a map of America like we do and wanted to hit every, every single state. He had that among the Mediterranean land that he was in. He wanted to go as many places as he could go. He wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to go to Philipp, uh, Philippi. He wanted to be among the people he wanted to be among all of these people, and he wasn't able to make it to every one of these places when he wanted to make it to these places, and some, not at all. But what he did is he was very effective in training others around him and saying, I can't be everywhere. Go. And he was comfortable saying that they would represent God in a favorable light, that Jesus had left a lasting impact on his life, and by, by lifting others up and helping them know Christ and grow in Christ and have that relationship with Christ, then he felt comfortable too saying that, that, that they will be able to take care of your needs even if I can't make it there. That they will, they, will, they will bring what I'm telling and they will help you understand it, but they're very much... There's very much in this passage, not only is he trying to talk about Timothy and the purpose of Timothy, this is also for you and I to understand and take note of. That there are certain attributes that are there. He says in verse 21, it says, For everyone looks out for their own interests, not, on, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself... Because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. And so there's, there's an understanding that, that in, this, in this time that he has proved himself. But there's a warning to us that we cannot forget that we need to have concern for others around us. That we need to look out for others' interests more so than ourselves. And you might say, well, Pastor, I like to take care of my own self and my family. I like to take care of those things going in and out of my life. And, and, and I think that that's an acceptable manner when it doesn't overshadow the call of Christ in our lives. This is not a self-centered, self-calling, self-to-me. This is a calling to do something only God can do in our lives. This is a calling to live differently. And, and, and it's a time that you and I have to understand. We must spend moments, hours, days at the feet of the Father to learn, to grow, to know, to lead, to guide. And it isn't about us just storing up this knowledge in some kind of base in our head as if we're a computer. This knowledge is meant to be sent out and is meant to be told. We are meant to pass on this knowledge to others. We are meant to stop people in this world and help them understand their need for Christ, but how to grow in Christ too. It's, it's not enough just to tell somebody, here's who Jesus is, but we must live it out in a most tangible and relational manner where others can say, you know what, I'm going to mimic their life and their diligence, and I want Christ to grow in me like he grows in them. That there were many who left an everlasting kind of impact in my life that have since gone from this world. 
And there are many in your life that no doubt if you were to go back and chart kind of retrospectively how things came about in your life and how you got to this point that took a great interest in your life, that chose to speak to you and let you know some things. There are many of you that that have favorite books of the Bible that have left a lasting mark on your life.